Okay, so this is chapter 23, and we're going to talk about drugs for lipid disorder. So really we're talking about HDLs, LDLs, triglycerides, VLDLs, those kinds of things. Uh, so first we're going to go over all that stuff. I know you already know everything about it, but we're going to go over it anyway just as a review. And then we're going to talk about the drugs. Okay, so we're going to go over these drugs uh, with, yeah. All right, so... Um, so first of all, lipids and cardiovascular disease, we know they're related, and hyperlipidemia is the term for lipids in general in the blood, and uh, hypercholesterolemia is more specific to high levels of cholesterol in the blood. And both of these, um, you know, because they're related, are major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And so really, when we treat, when we're treating lipid disorders, we're not really treating a disease. We're, we're trying to prevent a disease that high lipids uh, can, are associated with. So we could say that it causes heart disease. So, because um, we like to use terms like it's a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So we know that high lipids, uh, specifically high LDLs, high triglycerides, uh, are associated with cardiovascular disease. And most patients are asymptomatic until it produces symptoms. So that's why people get tested. They get their their CBC, they have their lipid tests, and when they're when they're high, then you start to discuss uh, treatment plans, so so you can prevent the cardiovascular disease. Okay, so um, so pharmacologically uh, is not always the uh, the first approach, and uh, in fact, the reason that people have high lipids is not really known, uh, not completely, but we know that genetics plays a big role in it, um, and lifestyle. So what you're, what you're eating and basically just, just what, your, what your enzymes, what your proteins are doing in there uh, that, are, that are leading to higher or more healthy uh, lipid profiles. Okay, so we know that diets high in saturated fat and lack of exercise contribute. So that's a, a correlation that's seen for, for some reason, uh, eating a lot of saturated fats uh, will ultimately reduce in higher low-density lipoproteins, higher cholesterol. So, um, <clears throat> so those things are all related. And uh, and then genetics. Uh, some people some people will have a, a high HDL profile, and and a uh, and also or a low LDL profile, or the other way around, where it just it just doesn't work out. Which obviously is probably what you're going to come across more in your careers. So dyslipidemia, that's a term that's thrown around. Uh, it could be, it's just abnormal lipids, uh, levels of lipids, and it could be excess or deficient, but usually, usually when we use it, we're, we're talking about excess, but it could be, it could be either way. It just means it's, it's off. Okay. So the three types of lipids, triglycerides. Okay. So triglycerides, remember triglycerides, it's got that glycerol, and then it has the fatty acids that are, that are hanging from it. Remember, Fatty acids can be saturated or unsaturated, so uh, so that's what we're talking about with triglycerides. Um, account for ninety percent of total lipids in the body, and then phospholipids. I think most of us know phospholipids as being part of a, a cell membrane, and so we're not going to really talk about that too much. They're they're in there, but that's just not something that we that we really pay much attention to. And then this one, which is steroid steroids. So a steroid is just a, a sort of a chemical um, structure. And, and so it looks, it looks like this. So it has this kind of a structure. And then it just has different things on it. Okay, so different moieties, I guess you would call them. And, uh, and so what your body does is that it produces something called cholesterol from using this steroid background. And cholesterol is kind of the, uh, the framework for a lot of other things that are made. So from cholesterol, which is a steroid, from cholesterol, the, the liver primarily makes things like vitamin D, uh, bile acids. Okay, so we've, we've, we haven't talked much about uh, the production of bile acids or what happens to bile acids after after they're made but we did talk about bile salts which are you know the salt version of a bile acid and um, so kind of the same thing and and how that 
works to sort of emulsify fats in our diet and you know it's released through the gallbladder in the bile that kind of thing we talked about that uh, but now we're going to get into a little bit more about about how the liver is producing that and what ramifications that has for uh, your cholesterol levels uh, also some other hormones like cortisol the stress hormone estrogen progesterone testosterone these are all steroid hormones and the body makes them, specifically the liver primarily, uh, makes them from, uh, from cholesterol. I, I shouldn't say that these are all made in the liver. They're not. Uh, but, but bile acids certainly are. So, um, but they're all made from cholesterol. And cholesterol is made in the liver. That's, that's what I meant. So the body makes about 70% or uh, 75% of the cholesterol it's, it's, it needs, which is kind of why that genetic factor is so important because we're really making cholesterol. And uh, the remaining 25% comes from the diet. And that's, you know, something we have some control over. Although if we don't get as much, if we don't get enough cholesterol in the diet, then your liver will just sort of pump up the, the, the production speed, production rate of cholesterol and try to make more. Okay. All right. So lipoprotein. So as we know, fat can't really move through the, uh, the blood vessels. It kind of gets glob, globbed up and, and, uh, and so that just, that just can't happen. So it's packed away in these nice little lipoproteins and that's how it moves through. Okay, um, so lipoproteins are carriers of lipid molecules because these lipids are insoluble and they consist of cholesterol. So you have cholesterol inside these guys. Well, this is showing a cholesterol as part of the membrane, which is true. Uh, but then most of the cholesterol is inside. And um, triglycerides, which triglycerides are also inside. And then... Um, and then there's this little protein carrier, okay? So here, so uh, the proteins are apoproteins, and there are different apoproteins, and there are certain diseases that are associated with the way you make different apoproteins as well. And the apoprotein is really there, so receptors like if, if a muscle cell or a, or a fat cell or something like that needs, or any other kind of cell, wants to have more cholesterol inside it, then, then it'll make a receptor and, and these, these apoproteins will bind to that receptor. And it also gives some identity as to, as to what they are, whether they're HDL or LDL. And speaking of that, there are three main types. There are high density lipoproteins, HDLs, which are, which are good. And there are low density lipoproteins, which are bad. And then there are VLDLs, which are very low density lipoproteins, which are mostly triglycerides. I don't know that we, uh, give them a good or bad uh, designation. Uh, it's, it's usually something you don't want as many triglycerides, but we like to keep, we like to say good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. All right, and, and that's HDL, LDL. So let's go through those really quickly. So low density lipoproteins, LDLs transport cholesterol from the liver to the tissues and organs. Uh, that's, that's true, um, but the liver also will take in uh, LDLs because LDLs are really kind of formed from VLDLs and that happens in the plasma and those will kind of turn into LDLs in the plasma and then and so the liver is one of the organs that will actually take up LDLs too that's a liver right there looks like a liver and um, and so so but those but those LDLs can go to a lot of different places and the liver can you know secrete LDLs and then and uh, and then those can move out into circulation. I just don't want you to forget that really about half of the LDLs that are in circulation will also go back to the liver. All right, um, so, but anyway, LDLs carry uh, the highest amount of cholesterol. So that's the sort of the distributing package to get to get cholesterol to other parts of the body. Now we call that bad cholesterol because it does contribute to, to atherosclerotic plaques. So these plaques that develop um, are when you know these LDLs kind of kind of infiltrate and then and then the immune system kind of wreaks havoc and and causes these plaques to form which can then uh, form clots and and heart disease heart heart attacks and strokes and all kinds of uh, chaos that can happen from that all right um, 
All right, so very low density lipoproteins, that's the main carrier of triglycerides, which is what this area out here is supposed to be showing, I guess these chunks in here, the cholesterol. Uh, so these are mainly uh, triglycerides, and, and this is what I mentioned earlier, through bodily processes that they become LDLs, and this can happen in the, uh, it can happen in the plasma, it can, uh, so, so that's, that's not necessarily what's going on only in the liver. All right, uh, but they, but usually we think VLDLs, we think of as being, you know, high, high in triglycerides. All right, and then the HDLs. The HDLs are manufactured in the liver and the small intestine, and they reverse cholesterol transport. So that means when there are too many, too much cholesterol in a certain cell, that these guys can kind of pick that up and, and move it away and take it back to the liver so the liver has more uh, cholesterol that it that it can do stuff with some of that stuff we'll talk about. Uh, it's considered good cholesterol because it's kind of the cleaner uh, in terms of cholesterol anyway, and uh, so transports cholesterol for destruction and removal from the body. So high levels of HDLs is a good thing. Okay, so that's that's what we want. We want high levels of, of HDLs and low levels of LDLs. That's what we desire. So when we look at uh, specific amounts, so we have, so the ones in reds, red is really, really what you should know. They're, they're not terrible numbers to remember. Total cholesterol, 200 LDLs, about half that. Uh, less than 100 is what is what is ideal. HDLs we want, and it depends on if, you know, male or female, uh, females have tend to have more uh, more HDLs or a higher requirement for HDLs, and uh, and so so we just we just to make it easy, we just break it down to one number here, and we say greater than sixty is is desirable. Um, triglycerides, we want those to be less than one hundred and fifty. So really, two hundred total, a hundred LDL. Um, 60 HDL, we want more than 60, of course, for HDL, and then we want less than 154 for serum triglycerides. And, you know, it, it depends, those things will vary depending on, you know, your disease state or, or something like that. So we're just trying to get a, a basic round number. Uh, kind of a guideline, something to, to, to go from. All right, so uh, lifestyle changes. Now, we don't necessarily usually if somebody comes in and they have you know high high triglycerides high LDLs low LDLs whatever uh, usually the first the first plan is to try to control it by changing lifestyle and by that really we mean you know diet and exercise uh, because that that can that can do quite quite a lot uh, so so lifestyle change should always be included in any treatment plan for reducing blood lipid levels um, and many people can control it this way uh, without without taking medication. So some of the things you want to do, monitor blood lipid levels, maintain your weight, okay, so that's a, a correlation thing. Uh, implement a medically supervised exercise plan. So basically you want to exercise, but don't exercise to the point that it kills you. Um, reduce dietary saturated fats. Again, there's a uh, there's a correlation between the consumption of saturated fats and your and your LDL levels. Trans fats, we should get rid of those anyway. Uh, and also cholesterol. Even though it used to be, oh, you should reduce your intake of cholesterol and then we figured out, oh, well, you know, you reduce your intake of cholesterol, your your liver is just going to make more cholesterol. Uh, but, you know, a serious serious reduction kind of kind of puts the liver a little bit of a disadvantage for making cholesterol so it can it can have an effect and we'll see that uh, later when we talk about uh, azetamide and stuff like that. Alright, so um, increase soluble fiber in the diet that seems to help and eliminate tobacco use because it, it can kill you in lots of ways. Alright, so uh, here are the drugs drugs for dyslipidemia. Statins is the first one we're gonna we're gonna talk about. That's usually the, the first go-to. Uh, there's also something called bile acid resins. And again, when we talk about bile acids, we're talking about uh, what the liver produces to make the, the bile salts. And um, so and then niacin, which is a, uh, a B vitamin B3 vitamin and then fibric acid and cholesterol absorption inhibitor. So I'm just going to say the names of these. The statins is HMG-CoA inhibitor. Atorvastatin is the prototype drug and that's what we call Lipitor. 
Uh, bile acid resins is cholestyramine, which is questran, as we call that. And niacin is nicotinic acid, so that's reasonable. And fiber, fibric acid agents, uh, gemfibrozole, fibrozole, gemfibrozole, or lopin. Um, and then the cholesterol absorption inhibitors is zetamibe, okay, or zetia is, is the, uh, the prototype, or it's the drug for that. I don't know if it's listed as a prototype, but, but it's, you, you have to know that this, this goes along with uh, cholesterol uh, absorption inhibitor. Same thing with uh, gemfibrozole and fibric acid agents. All right, fibric acid, fibric, whatever. All right, so these drugs all have different mechanisms making it possible to combine drug treatments uh, from drugs of different classes. And, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about that, the mechanisms anyway, but uh, because they have different mechanisms, they can kind of work together uh, in different places to lower your, uh, mostly lower your LDLs and also raise your uh, HDLs and lower your triglycerides, depending on the drug. All right, so this is table 23.2, and uh, it lists, so here are the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. We haven't talked about how that works yet, but we will. Uh, bile acid sequestrants, cholestyramine, fibric acid drugs, gemfibrozole, and then the, uh, the others. Well, I can go ahead and say over here we have the adverse effects, which of course you need to know the adverse effects, and we'll, we'll hit on those a little bit more. In, in more detail in a minute, uh, but the adverse effects are listed over here. Of course, you don't have to know um, dose, so because that'll that'll usually be well, I don't know. It's just too much to remember, which you're already thinking you have too much to remember. So I guess that's one less thing. So um, and then to continue on with the table, uh, azitamibe is here and. Um, and then niacin are also, so these, these are also uh, drugs. And we'll talk about the mechanisms of each of these, and here we go. So uh, first of all, we're gonna talk about statins. Now remember, cholesterol is made in the liver, okay? So this is, this is a much better liver. So cholesterol is made in the liver, and this little box right here shows you the process. Now, of course, you don't have to know all of these molecules and all the enzymes involved, but there are a number of steps involved in making cholesterol, okay? And, and statins block one of these. So HMG coenzyme A reductase enzyme is required to produce this other uh, molecule intermediary called mevalinate. And if, if this doesn't happen, Okay, so statins get in there and they kind of interrupt it. They kind of take the place of H HMG-CoA uh, in the binding site. And, and so this, this process can't take place. And so it's not that it can't take place at all, but, but it, um, I mean, the liver still is going to be able to make some cholesterol, but, it, but you can, by dose, you can kind of reduce how much cholesterol the liver, the liver makes um, by interrupting that process. Okay. Um, so interfere with the synthesis of cholesterol, first drugs of choice to reduce blood lipid levels. And the, exa the example of the prototype is atorvastatin, some of the others, fluvastatin, lovastatin, rosuvastatin, simvastatin, all of them end in statin. So that's why they are the statin drugs, okay? So how they work, yeah, we just said um, that the liver makes enzymes, but there's something else that's kind of important, and that is that if the liver isn't able to make as much cholesterol, then what it does is it tries to, you have, you have these LDLs circulating in your blood all the time and your liver knows that. And so what it'll do is it'll start increasing its LDL receptors. And so it's gonna try to draw some of these LDLs that are circulating to pull them in so it has more uh, cholesterol to work with because it's trying to make things like bile salts. Okay, so it needs a steady supply of cholesterol, and if it can't make it itself, then it's going to start pulling it in from from elsewhere and start robbing other other areas of it. Which, if your cholesterol levels are already really high, that's a good thing. Okay, uh, because if these aren't in circulation, then your LDL levels are lower. 
Okay, so that's I mean it just it just uh, just sort of fits. All right, so um, so the liver senses so. Uh, the liver also has receptors to which circulating LDLs bind that transport LDLs into the liver to make bile salts for bile or bile acids for bile salts. Uh, statins block the production of cholesterol by blocking the HMG coenzyme A, HMG CoA. Uh, the liver senses the lower cholesterol and reacts by making more LDL receptors. Puts them out there on the uh, on on the surface near the uh, blood vessels. Uh, that are actually running through it technically, um, but but it puts it puts more LDL receptors and pulls draws more of that LDL into the liver and out of the bloodstream, out of the serum. So the increased number of LDL receptors transports more LDL from the blood, lowering blood LDL levers levels levels. The liver also slows the secretion of VLDLs, which uh, can trigger. Uh, uh, which lowers triglycerides le levels, so that's a uh, another another effect, and it and it can also through through some other mechanisms that I don't think we really know, uh, it also can lead to an increase in uh, in HDL, okay, a small small increase in HDL. All right, um, so uh, so this is this picture I just left it in. It was from your book. It looks like somebody. Actually, it looks like somebody didn't work very hard on it. It looks like a liver I would draw, but um, but either way, it's uh, it kind of it kind of shows you here the uh, the HMG CoA and how that process is blocked and uh, so lowers your your cholesterol and and it also shows how the cholesterol is used to make these bile bile acids and then the bile acids um, move into the bile and uh, and into the intestines. All right. So some things to note uh, for statins, uh, monitor liver function tests. You're, we're talking about processes that are taking place in the liver, and so, uh, so that can uh, rob uh, functionality from other things. Uh, hopefully it doesn't, but it's something to keep an eye on. Don't use with pregnancy or breastfeeding uh, because we don't want to change the baby's ability to, to make cholesterol. All right, so and watch for signs of GI upset. Uh, the prototype drug I've been mentioning, atorvastatin or Lipitor, uh, and we just went over this, inhibits HGM, H, HMG, have I been saying that wrong? HMG-CoA reductase. Uh, primary use reduces serum lipid levels. And uh, that's not very specific. It reduces LDLs. And it kind of also increases HDLs a little bit. Okay, not as much as niacin. All right. Um, so this is your this is your drug sheet. Uh, I don't know if there's anything I wanna I wanna point out from this. Um, just kind of go over it. All right. So the next one. So those were statins. The next one are bile acid sequestrants. Now remember what we were making to put into the bile acids. We were making bile salts, or I'm sorry, into the into the. Uh, into the bile, we're making bile salts. Okay. Now, what these do is they so these bile salts. This is an awful picture. So the bile salts are released from the liver. So they're made there. Bile acid, bile acids made in the liver and released into the small intestine, the duodenum, when you have fat in your diet. Now. One thing we never really talked about is what happens to these bile salts after they've been released. Okay, so now we know they have a cholesterol component to them. Okay, so that's good. So we never talked about what happens to them after they're released into the intestine. We know what they do. They emulsify fats, so the fats, so the enzymes can break down fats. We know that they do that. But the thing is that once they're in the intestine, they're just like any other food source, and they're just reabsorbed. So the body's, you know, it's efficient. I think it's accidentally efficient in this case. It just doesn't know it's not food. And we'll reabsorb it. It moves back into the liver. And so these are recycled. And so we have this, this cholesterol that's being recycled. Well, uh, that's nice for the liver because it doesn't have to work as hard to make, uh, make cholesterol. However, these bile acid sequestrants block that reabsorption or that absorption from from the intestines, so these bile salts end up being lost in the feces. Okay, and they do this; they bind with the bile acids and prevent the the absorption from the from the intestine, and so they're excreted in the stool. 
Uh, because bile acids cannot be reabsorbed, the liver has to compensate by making more bile acid. And what's it going to do when it, does, when it finds out that it's low on cholesterol? It's going to increase the LDL receptors, LDL receptor expression, and it's going to pull the LDLs from circulation. Okay? Makes sense. Um, so it's all about, I guess, starving the liver of, of cholesterol. In this case, it's doing it by not allowing it to be recycled. Uh, and it can be used in combination with statins because, because the other thing that happens is if you just use the bile acid sequestrants, the liver's just going to make more of this HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. It's just going to make more of that enzyme and start making more cholesterol. So, but if you also give it a statin, then the statin will kind of block the HMG-CoA and really force it to pull the LDLs from, from your blood uh, circulation. Okay, so example, col um is an example of a bile acid sequestrant. So proto prototype drug, uh, cholestyramine is our, is our prototype drug. I, I put the other one in here and it also has a coal in it, but spelled differently, I think. Um, so cholestyramine is our, is our prototype drug. And, um, and its mechanism, we just went over the mechanisms, binds with bile acids and increasing cholesterol excretion in the fluid or in the stool. So it binds with bile acids and doesn't allow them to be absorbed in the intestine back into, back into the liver. Okay, and so it lowers serum, uh, serum lipid levels and adverse effects, they're usually not so bad, but uh, GI tracts such as bloating, constipation, and, and people who take them say that they taste very, very bad. Okay, so they're, they're bad tasting. Um, so expect that. So, and it, and there have been some studies that say that they may actually increase triglycerides. I, I don't, I, I don't know. That wouldn't necessarily be, be a good thing. Uh, but if you're not having trouble with triglycerides, if triglycerides are not your issue, then, then this is a, a good alternative. Uh, they, because they're sequestrants, they can, they can also bind other drugs. That's something to keep in mind. I mean, these, these things are, are binding bile salts to prevent them from being absorbed. So the idea that it could sort of cross over and also bind some other things like certain drugs that have similar uh, lipid profiles um, isn't, isn't out of the question. And so uh, that could cause drug-drug uh, interactions, depending on what, the, what that particular drug is for the other drug. All right, um, so some things to note. Monitor for significant GI effects. Uh, obtain careful history for past GI disorders. And here's the cholestyramine drug sheet. Um, it's a powder that's mixed with a fluid before being taken once or twice daily. It sounds, sounds awful. It sounds like a really bad tasting, like, I don't know, I was going to say protein shake, but more of a lemonade shake. I don't know what it tastes like. I don't want to know. All right. So, uh, but anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's how that's, that's how that's taken. All right. Um, so niacin nicotinic acid, <laughs> niacin is a B complex vitamin. It's B3. And, um, and it's as a vitamin nutrient, you need around 14 to 16 milligrams per day, okay? As a hyperlipidemia drug, the dose is around two grams per day, so that's 2,000 milligrams. So as you can see, you can't just, you can't just take a handful of vitamins and, and get the same effect um, because you would really be taking a lot of vitamins. You can't just, you know, take, take a couple of extra vitamins and expect to see anything. Because, because the difference, the dosing difference is so large. Now, the other thing is that the vitamin form that we usually take is nicotinamide, and that's different than nicotinic acid, which is what we would, we would uh, give for, um, for hyperlipidemia. And the nicotinamide, the vitamin form, it seems to have no effect on lipids, so it hasn't been shown to have an effect. So uh, if somebody thinks that they can take more B3 vitamins and lower their lipid levels, uh, they probably can't. All right, so uh, niacin, so we're calling that our niaspan, decreases VLDL production, okay, and releases and release from the liver, leading to reduced LDL levels. 
And one thing that, that ni nicotinic acid or niacin is pretty good at is also raising your L HDL levels. So, you know, you could take this along with an, an LDL lowering drug and, uh, and it, would, it would probably help to get you kind of in the range that you need to be. It depends on how, how stubborn someone's body is being uh, as to how you're going to combine these drugs. Uh, so the mechanism is not clear, but it has something to do with inhibiting production of the proteins in VLDLs so they're not able to be made. Uh, you don't make VLDLs. VLDLs turn into HDLs, so you're not going to have as many HDLs. Or I'm sorry, VLDLs turn into LDLs, so you're not going to have as many LDLs. So it's going to lower both of these LDLs and VLDLs. Okay, and like I said, it also it also has been shown to, uh, to pretty significantly raise HDL levels, which is nice. Um, it has numerous side effects, adverse effects. Uh, causes vasodilation. That's just something that uh, that niacin does. So flushing, as well as hot flashes, nausea, excess gas, diarrhea. Um, it's, it's broken down in the liver, so it can cause hepatotoxicity. It competes with um, urea for secretion in the kidneys, and so you have an increase in uric acid in the body, which can lead to gout. Okay. So, so all of these things that are, are side effects, so uh, you have to kind of weigh that in terms of whether or not the person is going to benefit from it. All right, so some things to note with niacin, monitor the patient's liver function, like I said, because it's, uh, it's competing for, for breakdown. Monitor uric acid levels, especially if they're predisposed to gout. Uh, uh, monitor blood sugar levels, so it can, so it can have an effect. Uh, niacin, remember, niacin is a, uh, it's also a vitamin, and so it has, it has a lot of different functions in the body. I'm not sure exactly what the, the mechanism is for blood sugar levels, but uh, it can have an effect on that as well, which isn't, a, which isn't a big surprise for something that uh, probably has many functions in the body. All right, um, so the next ones, not the last one, but the next one are the fibric acid, acid agents. And what just happened? There we go. Uh, so fibric acid agents, and their mechanism isn't really known. It, uh, it seems to increase um, the activity of this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, okay? um, which is something that, that uh, breaks down uh, uh, lipoproteins, breaks, breaks them down, so, um, or breaks down lipids. And, um, and so, but there are other mechanisms that have been that have been proposed. I read some of them, and nobody seems to really really know for sure. I keep putting my hand on this thing. I'm sorry. If I put my hand on it wrong, it causes it to do that. Okay. Um, so that's 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 it. We we don't really know the mechanism too well, but. Um, Adverse effects. Um, oh, 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 oh! I want to point out tr for treating hypertriglyceridemia. Okay, so so whereas we were talking about lowering LDLs, which is what uh, most of these we talked about do, and like niacin is pretty good at raising HDLs. This one is very good at lowering triglycerides. TG for tri triglycerides. Um, so that's uh, so if somebody has very high triglycerides, but maybe not not such a big problem with um, with LDLs, HDLs, then then this might be this might be a good way for them for them to go. Okay, some adverse effects: GI distress. Watch for bleeding in patients on anticoagulants. Um, like particularly, we're talking about warfarin. Okay. Uh, because it because it can reduce reduce the uh, the clotting ability, muscle pain, gallstones, and gallstones really anything that's causing uh, more cholesterol to be produced because gallstones uh, one are are made up of uh, have a lot of cholesterol in them, so cholesterol is one of the components of gallstones anyway. Um, so let's see for treatment of hypertriglyceridemia and hypercholesterolemia. Uh, produces few few serious adverse effects, but uh, increases likelihood of gallstones. Um, let's see, hepatic impairment. I was thinking there was something something else to 
point out. Maybe maybe I already did. Okay. Um, minister with meals to decrease GI distress. So go through that more carefully than I just did. All right, so some things to note about fibric acid agents. Uh, assess for complaints of GI distress. That's really one of the, the main um, adverse effects before starting the drugs. Uh, and I guess this is pretty important in terms of drug-drug interactions. Use with warfarin may potentiate anticoagulation, anticoagulant effects. So you want to monitor their ability to clot, which is this prothrombin time, you know, how long it takes to form the clot, the, uh, the INR. Uh, or prothrombin time over INR. We haven't really talked about that that much, but it's just a, uh, it's international. It's because everybody uses different units to, uh, to sort of figure out uh, clotting time and how much, how it takes place. So the INR is just a, a, a normalized regulated ratio to just sort of figure out how, how quickly uh, clotting takes place. All right. Um, so, a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. So, ezetimide is that, and really all that's doing is it's not allowing you to absorb cholesterol in your small intestine. Okay, so if you have somebody who just can't stop eating cholesterol, then maybe they can take ezetimide. Um, although that's that's really not a good reason uh, to put somebody on drugs but uh, it inhibits the absorption of cholesterol in the small intestine resorting, resulting in a small reduction of blood serum LDL okay so when we talk about serum we're also basically plasma um, so small reduction in LDL serious side effects are uncommon minor, minor side effects include nasopharyngitis my, myalgia so um, upper respiratory tract infection, anthralgia, and, and uh, diarrhea, probably because you're, you're keeping more cholesterol in your, in your body. Okay, so this is the end of the lecture portion. The remaining slides are for easy access to important information. I just make it sound fun, don't I? All right. Stop.